All right, Psalm 31. Let's call this one Pray for Your Blind Spot in this chapter where David is going to take a little bit different approach to our PRA model. He is still going to offer praise. He is still going to recall the things that God has done to justify that praise and use all of that as a basis for making a future request. But this time he is going to make the request first, asking in the first few verses for God to be his refuge and not let him be put to shame, asking him to not only deliver him, but to incline his ear, understanding that God's ear is not a guarantee. David is going to go on to say that one of the reasons why he is asking God to be his refuge is that he's been David's refuge in the past, delivering him from the nets or the traps that have been set in his blind spot, thus the title of this chapter. And so he is now recalling the reason why he is asking God to again be a refuge, understanding the way that God has been a refuge from hidden things or things hidden in his blind spot in the past. As he's going to go on to say uh, in his recall that he hates those in verse six who pay regard to worthless idols. And that is a preacher trap, at least for me, because that's a sermon unto itself. Understanding that that whole concept of modern idols often goes to, I think it's Isaiah 44, and the way that we tend to create God in our own image. Understanding that, I think, like I said, it's Isaiah 44 that describes the way in which an idolater takes either a piece of wood or a piece of metal and fashions it into the image of something familiar, something that the idolater can control and manipulate, as opposed to actually seeking the counsel that God would give. And taken to at least one extreme, it gives the idolater or an individual the chance to take their own ideas and elevate them to the status of God's law. And hopefully without wading into that preacher trap or tangent any further, David goes back to the pattern of, again, asking and then recalling where in verse 9 he is going to ask God to be gracious to him for he is in distress. And it's actually going to sound like great distress as he recalls toward the end of verse 10 the fact that his distress is actually linked to his own iniquity as he is going to further recall the way in which his iniquity has now opened a door for his adversaries, who he's going to talk about going on through about verse 13, where he is going to again ask uh, God after saying, but I trust in you, please rescue me from my adversaries, understanding the way in which they may be, may be attempting to take what he actually did and magnify his suffering far beyond what would be a just penalty for whatever sin, iniquity, or transgression. David has committed. It's something that we're going to see again in chapter 35, where David is literally going to talk about the way in which his enemies have tried to magnify themselves against him. But just in case that's not what's going on here, it does seem to still appeal to something we saw in the law back in Deuteronomy chapter 19, where it said, if a false witness comes into court, that false witness was to actually suffer the damage intended for the accused, understanding in this case, David would not have been falsely accused, but it's probably just as wrong to falsely inflate the penalty for whatever it was that he actually did. And in that regard, David is going to go on in his prayer or his request to God to ask God, let the wicked be put to shame in the way seemingly that they were looking to shame him. As David will seem to conclude that pattern of asking and recalling, asking and recalling, asking God based upon his recall of what God has been willing to do in the past, he is going to go on to praise God for the way in which he not only protected David's blind spot, but he protects the blind spots of those who take refuge in him. Specifically around verse 20, he is going to say, in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. The thing that caught my attention in addition to the way in which David appreciates God's willingness to protect our blind spots is once again the fact that David is not saying that God writes us a blank check. He's saying that God is willing to protect the blind spots of those who wait for him. How do we know? Because in the very last verse it points back to something we talked about last week when he says, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord, which reminded me of this. Even though I'm jumping around a little bit, back in verse 19, he talks about those who take refuge in the Lord publicly. And so once again, it's going back to that whole distinction that we've seen between personality and character, what we project as opposed to what we are. 
when David said that God is good to those who take refuge in him in the sight of the children of mankind, it reminded me of Survivor, that show that is uh, in a lot of ways the foundation for a lot of reality television today where getting ahead has a lot to do with your ability to spin circumstances in your favor and quite possibly maneuver in other people's blind spots. David seems to be praying in a way that reminds us that God's attitude towards our blind spots may have a lot to do with the way that we maneuver in the blind spots of others.